Welcome back into the Lions 24-7 podcast. It is Blue White Week here in Happy Valley. The spring game is on Saturday. We look forward to seeing a bunch of you back in Beaver Stadium, the first true full Beaver, Beaver Stadium spring game experience since 2019. Long overdue. A lot of recruiting implications there. Certainly, we're taking a longer look at the roster this week, which we've been discussing for the past few weeks, uh, about a month of spring ball in the books at this point, uh, 15 total practices culminating on Saturday. Uh, Sean, we're going to focus on some guys to watch on offense. We'll look a little bit closer at defense later in the week. By then, we'll also have had another look at this team on the practice field. Player interviews, James Franklin available, Terry Smith, the cornerbacks coach available this week. A bunch going on at lines247.com. Here on the podcast, though, we're going to start on the recruiting trail and a significant move in terms of the timeline for a prominent Philadelphia prospect. Yeah, Jamil Lyons is a guy that we've been watching for a long, long time. It's been up to Penn State several times. The uh, six foot four, two hundred and forty five pound edge prospect from Philadelphia Roman Catholic was once again on campus uh, over, uh, on Monday, excuse me, not even over the weekend. He was on campus a couple of weekends ago. So two visits in April and then on the heels of his visit yesterday, decides to move his decision up from August 4th, which seemed like a pretty, you know, hard and fast date. I mean, he was pretty uh, adamant that he wanted to do it on August 4th. And now all of a sudden it's coming on Friday. Uh, I mean, you could read into a few things there, but you read into the crystal ball. I have, I put one in actually before he visited yesterday for Penn State, feeling pretty good about the Nittany Lions chances here. Again, 6'4", 245. They see him as an edge player. I'll be interested to see if he sticks there long term, but this is a guy who looks like he's older than me, even though he is uh, just a 17 or 18 year old uh, high school senior to be. Uh, but this is a guy that Penn State got at camp a while ago. I'm sure we will probably talk about him later in the week, but he, they got him to camp in June last year. Uh, really impressive with his workouts, has improved his academic situation, which was the big holdup in the first place. I thought this was a guy who would get to the spring and coaches from all over the country would come in and see him, offer him to try and slow the process down, maybe get him on campus for an official visit. I know he had talked about taking officials and being you know, into that process and everything like that before, but it seems like this one's uh, trending favorably for the Nittany Lions. Wouldn't be a surprise at all, and uh, I think it'd be a good pickup. We have him as a four-star on 24-7 sports, a three-star on the 24-7 sports composite, um, but this is a guy that the staff has has really liked his, ac- or his athletic ability for a long, long time. Yeah, and out of Philadelphia, Roman Catholic continuing a good trend of recruiting prospects out of the city. Uh, six foot four, two, uh, 240 pound ranges lines. Got a top five, Sean, that he announced of Penn State, Pittsburgh, West Virginia, Cincinnati, and Illinois. And as you said, it kind of reiterated a few times during recent conversations that August 4th was going to be the day. Instead, 1 p.m. Friday ahead of the Blue White uh, game for Penn State and all the recruiting stuff happening. That you mentioned the crystal balls that are in uh, Brian Doan, Steve Wiltfong, yourself. I've got to get one in there as well. Uh, Penn State looking to bring on board an edge rusher. We talked about Neo Avery and and how things were trending toward that role for him. Um, this is a nice way to address that. And certainly, you're not done by any means. But we've said uh, a bit skewed right now in favor of offensive numbers for this recruiting class. And you're going to hit that double digit mark here pretty soon. They need defenders. Uh, he, he's a you know he's a big defensive end. He's one of those ones that we used to classify as a strong side defensive end um, at 245 pounds. Again. I thought this kid was going to be an interior guy. It reminds me kind of a couple of cycles back, Jared Harrison Hunt, who ended up at Miami, was silently committed to Penn State for there for a long time. Um, but uh, maybe type, like a Hakeem Beeman type. I mean, he, he just looks, number one, he looks older. He looks more physically advanced. And when he gets into a weight program, as a lot of these Philly guys do, I could see him blowing up and, and eventually being an interior guy. So we'll see what nature has to say about it. But from talking to people at Penn State, they think he can settle on the edge play at 265, 270 pounds and, you know, be one of those strong side guys. But he also has some burst. I, you know, his, uh, his uh, testing numbers last summer were really what caught the staff's attention. Um, his sophomore year was fine. Um, in his junior year, he took a step forward in film, but the athletic base is certainly there. Um, and it's a guy that you could see hanging on to the edge for a couple of years. And and you're right, the uh, the edge is a, is a question mark. You you take a look at the defensive end board. Neo Avery, obviously a guy that's still out there, a guy that they, they really want. But uh, um, you've got, uh, you know, Mason Robinson visited a couple of weeks ago. Desmond Umiozulu from Maryland uh, visited back in January. Penn State's in his top nine. Um, not a lot of cut and dry edge prospects. And that's, that's an interesting thing. Uh, sort of subplot here because we look at him at 6'4", 245, and you say, okay, that that's defensive end size. Well, some of these guys, you know, that it takes time for them to work up to that. You remember Adisa Isaac being 205 pounds 
back in the day. You're looking at getting these guys, and I know everybody wants the the 215 pound linebackers, but you're looking at some of these edge guys that will start at 210, 220 pounds and work their way up. And I, I you know, they've been productive at that in the last uh, couple of uh, or last couple of years for the guys that have come off the edge for Penn State. And of course, you can sell Jason away. You're going to be able to sell. Arnold Eva Kitty, you're going to be able to sell a lot. John Scott Jr. is doing a heck of a job right there. Um, and it looks like it will continue with Jamil Lyons. And if you can get Denai Dennis Sutton out there as a five star freshman, oh, potentially guy, doing, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, we always got to throw in there is, is we're, incoming. We're in summer. purgatory with those 2022 <laughs> prospects that haven't enrolled because we're so used to talking about Singleton and Aller yeah. and these guys that are on campus. And then we forget about those guys. So Denai, don't hold it against us. Uh, you, he's definitely going to be here and have an impact this year. And the edge rusher role, when we talk about it being such a priority for for NFL franchises in the draft and, and down here looking at the high school players, you know, you're watching film a lot of guys who were maybe maybe even safeties as high school sophomores. And then they work their way up to, to big to bigger guys, linebackers by the time they're high school seniors. But you don't see them there. You see them at the next level. And then there's guys who right now, wow, he's dominant defensive end, but he's 245 pounds at 16, 17 years old. You start to say, OK, does it make more sense down the line? Slide him inside. There, there is, you know, we, we see it here on the roster. You can't figure out quite, is the guy going to be an outside linebacker? Is he going to be in a defensive tackle? You kind of, you know, there's certain names that pop up with that conversation every year that we talk about. Um, and that's what makes us one of the more intriguing, I think, positions that, that every football program is trying to have a bit of an arms race because you want to be able to bring that uh, elite speed off the edge that isn't necessarily innate to the prototypical defensive end role. Yeah, and, and you've got body types of all uh, all sizes. I mean, you look at Dylan Gooden at Good Counsel, and not that he's not the highest guy on the board or anything like that, but he's 6'4", 200. I think he, he's listed at 205. He might be 200 pounds. I don't know. I saw him at the uh, Under Armour camp. He's skinny. So they're, they're, you're playing a, a wide array of body types and athletic abilities and things like that to, to a guy that you, go, you get up to a guy like Deny Dennis Sutton, and it's obvious he's ready-made. He's ready to go. Whereas a guy like Dylan Gooden, we've seen Chaka Tony was sub 200 when he showed up on campus. There was a, there's just a lot of uh, edge is such an all encompassing term. We switched from weak side, strong side defensive end, which were kind of archaic in terms of scouting to edge, which could mean an outside linebacker that goes after I mean, Tamir Robinson's ranked as an edge um, out of the, the uh, linebacker out of Pittsburgh. You know, he's a linebacker for Penn State, but he could be an edge player for others. So it's just such an all encompassing word where you're going from a guy that could be 195 pounds to a guy that could be 260. So it kind of helps cover that base. But at the same time, you're, you're dealing with a lot if you're a defensive line coach. And as we mentioned, we're just a few years removed from watching Damian Robinson rep with linebackers here at Penn State Prospect Camp. And now we're talking about him impacting that defensive end unit in 2022. Sean, uh, just coming out of a weekend that that did feature some significant in-state presence. Of course, that's going to happen with, with the recruiting um, as guys get in the seats for Beaver Stadium uh, on Saturday. But ahead of that, a really nice showing this pack past week. London Montgomery at running back. Kenny Johnson at wide receiver. A pill Phil Pashati at linebacker, names that I think are pretty familiar for our listeners at this point. And you start getting them repetitively on campus, you know, rubbing rubbing shoulders with some of the guys who are already committed to this program. You start to get some momentum. And, and you know, that's what you, what you what you were missing from the recruiting trail the last couple of springs here at Penn State and really across the college football. But we know how isolated this campus can be. With, with those in-state guys, you just want to keep getting them back as much as possible. You know, you maybe see one pop up again this weekend. Well, you never know um, because it is fairly easy to get back. Hopefully they don't have to deal with the snow that's falling outside my window right now. I think that'll be cleared out by the time it's 70 degrees on Saturday or whatever we're doing. Spring in Happy Valley, got to love it. Um, but uh, it was, you're looking at, at London Montgomery, the running back out of Scranton Prep. This is a guy that I think Penn State uh, said this last week in, in our notes, Penn State's turning up the heat. Um, you know, you look at Penn State's running back targets, Mark Fletcher off the board to, to, to Ohio State. You still look down and Trayon Webb could be all over the place. He's had a couple of commitments so far. Florida's still in there. South Carolina's still in there. A couple other schools, Tennessee, I think, <clears throat> excuse me, Tennessee is in there as well. Um, and then you kind of get back closer to home. Um, at London Montgomery's fairly obvious choice. I mean, Penn State kind of waited. Uh, if you asked him, he would probably say the offer came through a little bit late. Um, but I think they, you know, did their due diligence, especially with an in-state kid, as they often do. Um, got him on campus. He's had a great track season. He's gone sub 11 seconds. The speed questions really aren't, aren't really have never been the question with him. Um, and then you look at his running style, which I think was the question with him. And you, you feel pretty good, you know, five 
10 and a half, uh, 180 pounds. He's going to continue to grow. Um, but I think this is a situation where Penn State was, you know, they offered him and, and all offers are kind of contingent on things and different and things like that. But they're working their way up to, I think, uh, you know, meeting in the middle. And I think London Montgomery is an excellent candidate candidate to join this class eventually. Yeah. And, and Brian, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, you know, looking at, at Montgomery and how he may shift in, in 24 seven sports rankings. Some of those track results were going to play a role and really quickly. I think he went out and produced a 10, eight um, first week of April, answered some questions there. And I can understand why Penn state would, would be proactive as this market shifts with the running back and, and, you know, by, by accounts, it sounds like it's not necessarily the deepest of, of running back uh, recruiting classes, particularly within this region compared to some, We'll see. Uh, running back is a spot that Penn State's done very nicely for themselves, particularly with the in-state players, and they've got a target right there. Um, how, how about the uh, on the linebacker position here, uh, Phil Pashadi, um, he's someone that we, we kind of previewed his latest visit last week a little bit and the significance that maybe it carries. Um, you know, Is this a move where you talk about the in-state running back appeal? We just heard it from Tyler Elson last week, being the Pennsylvania kid, the LBU kind of brand. Now, in Phil's case, that offer came – you know, pretty, pretty fairly early in the process compared to a guy like Elsden. Um, where is Penn State kind of moving within his, I guess, uh, peripheral of his recruitment? Well, to be honest with you, which is, and I'll say this is kind of odd, have not heard back from Pichotti uh, since his visit, which, you know, I think things went well, but uh, it's just interesting to note that because he's usually very quick to get back. Um, I, I, you know, I see a couple of schools. Uh, this kid is not lacking for frequent fire miles. He's been out to N Oklahoma, Nebraska. I know Michigan State's in there. I think Michigan State and Oklahoma, the two top, uh, the two top schools, along with Penn State, the two top, uh, you know, uh, contenders to Penn State. Uh, you know, we have our crystal balls in for for the Nittany Lions. But you know, this is one I don't think it's a it's a slam dunk by any measure. Um, Josiah Trotter going off the board makes a difference. He committed to West Virginia last week. Um, so getting Pishotti back on campus, even though this was scheduled a long, long time ago, very important because he, you look at the top of the, the mic board and he's right up there. Of course, Jordan Hall at IMG and a couple of other guys that they want to get in and, and see on campus are, are right in there. But, uh, yeah, this is one that, that it's not done, but you like where Penn state stands considering the the other schools in the mix are a little bit further away. Now, I don't think he's ready for a decision. I think that when the time comes, Penn State will be in, you know, heavily in the mix. But I think he's going to want to get out and see some official visits. Uh, you know, we we've already seen um, a situation where he was high on Notre Dame early, but Notre Dame filled up the position, got somebody else, and, and you know, he kind of uh, was left without him, them in his top 12. And I'm sorry, I'm kind of stumbling on myself uh, as I get through this because I'm trying to read and, and talk at the same time. It's not as easy as it looks. Um, but uh, I think he's going to get out and see some see some more schools uh, this spring and this summer and then maybe make a decision before the season. But uh, like I said, would like to follow up with him on his visit, but he has not uh, has not gotten back uh, after his Friday visit, which is it's kind, of, it's kind of odd. Dallas town area receiver Kenny Johnson was back on campus. He's got a Penn State offer. He talked to Brian Doan uh, about the ability to get up there for a non-game kind of environment on campus. I think to this point he, he had seen the game action. This was kind of a, a closer look at, at the, the team, the university, and, and everything else you can get on, on kind of a uh, an off-season weekend visit. Um, sounds like he's going to be formulated in a top five, Sean. Penn State's in a great spot there. West Virginia is going to get an official visit for him, uh, but another those in-state guys who got up here. And, and another name that we got to mention in the 2024 class tying back to our conversation about recruiting in Philly and, and the in-state presence this past weekend Tysir Denmark who has got a ton of national attention in that 2024 cycle picked up a Penn State offer well before his sophomore year of high school and got the return trip in uh just a couple days ago or yesterday I should say yeah Tysir Denmark back on campus I think actually Ohio State's probably set the bar for him um, we'll see I mean Ohio State it's tough to say because you you look at how they're recruiting wide receivers and they're just taking you know, it's the top of the top. And you wonder if Tice here, Denmark, who checks in at number 110 nationally, number 19 wide receiver um, in the country for the composite, number 27 for 24 7 sports, is he in that top tier for Ohio State? So that'll be something I'm watching. But, you know, a lot of the big offers, Alabama came through with an offer. He's going to get out and see some, some schools. I, I think Penn State's in the mix, but I think they're a little bit lower on the list when you talk about him. But getting him back in, on campus, uh, conceivably having a teammate committed in Jameel Lyons, uh, eventually that could, you know, factor in there, but, uh, we'll, we'll, it's very much wait and see with Tice here, Denmark and getting back to Kenny Johnson. That's also a wait and see situation. This is a guy that we've talked about before 
who probably not one of the, the top guys on the wide receiver board, but conceivably could see him ending up at Penn State because of the in-state connections. They like him a lot as a player. Just some questions about his speed. Came to camp last summer, ran a 4-7. So, you know, there's there, there's a lot that, that goes on with that. We'd like to see him actually on the track this year. Um, but that's, you know, just me sort of thinking out loud. But, uh, yeah, busy couple of days for Penn State. Uh, they had uh, that, that group from Roman Catholic on. Also had a group from Maryland up, offered Jalen Harvey, the edge player from uh, Quince Orchard, who Damian Robinson came out of Quince Orchard a couple of years ago. Um, and then hosted David Hobbs, a uh, 6'4", 250-pound defensive lineman from North Carolina, whom they offered in uh, back in March. So a lot going for uh, for Penn State just on a sleepy little snowy little Monday. Uh, got a bunch of guys on campus. That snow is melting. I hope it's out of here by Wednesday, Sean. And and we focused a lot on the guys who got to campus from nearby. There's also some official visits being lined up. You have a, a report up here on Tuesday about a couple of Alabama prospects making the trip to Penn State. And then Derek LeBlanc uh, out of Florida, a top 24-7 defensive lineman. We, we've been talking a lot about an early enrollee, an early enrollee on the defensive line out of Florida. Easy for me to say. And uh, here's another one that's going to take a, a peek at Penn State later on with an official visit. This is something that we always look for. Who is going to try to take advantage of that flight with mom and dad or with whoever they're traveling with that otherwise would be out of the realm of possibility? And if you're Penn State, how much can you accomplish during that 48 hour window to make sure that you are in that conversation moving forward? Well, we've seen them do it before. They did it last year, mm -hmm. especially, um, you know, in June when they set up that big July that they had a guy like Zane Durant came up and, you know, that's his only, I think that was his only time on campus at that point. So um, you've got a lot working for you that time. I, it's going to be guys from out of the, you mentioned Derek LeBlanc, uh, Tamarian Parker's a top 100 kid from Alabama coming up. It's going to be a lot of guys, uh, Kobe Keenum, offensive lineman who's been up a couple of times before. It's going to be guys like that, guys that you you know their names, uh, not necessarily putting them up on the big board because it's so hard to get up to uh, to State College from down south. But um, some guys there, uh, LeBlanc's probably your top defensive line, interior defensive line target uh, for John Scott this cycle. He's already been up. He came up in January with uh, John Walker, his teammate. Um, so, I mean, some of these guys, you're going to have a shot to, to – to, I mean, that that's going to be your shot. Some of these guys uh, are naturally going to, you know, filter themselves and, and stay in the Southeast. But um, this is the time when you start seeing, you know, those those official visits scheduled to to sort of delay decisions to get them through the spring into the summer. And then you get to the summer, anything can happen. Penn State could go on another roll in July like they did last year. Maybe not as active, hopefully not as active as they did <laughs> last year, because that means their class will be more than full. Um, but uh, it, it, it'll be an interesting process to see how that works with the official visitors from from out of the out of the region. Yeah. One other note here from last week that, that we we did talk about heading into the weekend was the fact that five star quarterback Jaden Davis out of that 2024 class was returning to campus. He had, he had gotten up for a, a couple trips in 2021. Always nice to get a five star QB recruit to come through. Spoke very highly, as you would anticipate, coming off a trip to Happy Valley. But uh, to uh, Steve Wilt Fong, 24 7 Sports Director of Recruiting, a story up on lines247.com about that. Wanted to know he called Mike Yursich a mastermind. We've talked a lot about the lack of production on the field last year. He is working it with the quarterback recruits. I think it's very apparent there is an appeal there, and you continue to hear that when, when guys come to campus and head home. I'm going to unmute myself and come in and say Danny O'Brien, the offensive analyst, uh, has done a really, really good job with those guys as well. You ask quarterbacks that have been on campus and things like that, and he's been very active. Uh, wouldn't be surprised if he was in line for an on-field role eventually, but he's done a really good job in his uh, year and a half, I think, on campus uh, with quarterback recruits. All right, Sean, uh, something we're going to do here ahead of the spring game. We'll talk about defense later in the week, but five offensive players that we think are particularly worth watching on Saturday. Of course, we're excited to see everybody who's involved on the field on Saturday. But, Sean, I'll let you get going and uh, start wherever you'd like. Okay. I'll start with Nick Singleton. <laughs> I mean, shocking, <laughs> right? Um, really excited to see this guy. The, everybody that you talk to, it seems like he's the real deal. Um, I, you know, we can talk about splitting carries in the fall with Kevon Lee and whomever else is going to get them. Uh, but Nick Singleton, I, I mean, you think back, and this is well before your time, but this is when I was a student, you know, thinking of freshmen coming on for their first games, thinking of Derek Williams and Justin King and those guys. Um, I'm excited to see what Nick Singleton brings to the table. I think it's going to be exciting. I think it's going to be uh, he's going to be a dynamic player for the Nittany Lions. And, and you know, you can talk all you want about the quarterbacks and 
can talk all you want about the offensive line that he's going to be running behind, but the, the kid, I think, is just something special. I can't wait to see him. I'm going to actually stay at the running back position and go with Catron Allen because I think he'll get a significant amount of work uh, on Saturday. And um, I was going to say Singleton if you didn't, let's face it. But Catron Allen's a guy that, you, you know, a lot of times at, you hear Singleton's been fantastic and then it's dot, dot, dot. But Catron Allen's also coming along here and looks like he's going to be a player. So I'm very curious. I don't know how much run the veterans will get. And, and we don't really – we've seen so much of the of the other guys in this room and that hasn't been left the best taste in your mouth. Though. I think we're all a little anxious to see, okay, what else is cooking in the running back room? So for me, Catron Allen, some of that, that power from that physicality we've heard about with him – can that be reflected uh, against some Penn State defenders on the field in front of us in Beaver Stadium? Um, because if you come away and both those running backs look good, then uh, you know there, there's some juice for you going into the uh, the summer regarding this run game, which you know we, we've talked about with a shadow or a cloud or whatever you want to call over it. Yeah, guys, uh, number one, got to hold on to the football. We saw that uh, early in the season last year. It can change a lot of things very quickly. Got to pass protect. And then, of course, you know, make the most of it when you do have the football in your hands. Um, I'm going to move on. There's not a lot of offensive linemen to pick from, but I'm really excited to see what Olu Fashano can bring at left tackle. Uh, this is a guy I think can be a cornerstone for the offensive line moving forward, um, has had a good spring. Um, we, we talk about, you know, replacing Rasheed Walker, but I think, I think he's capable. He's physically capable of doing it. He's got some things to pick up and, and come along as, as any young player would at that position. But, uh, you know, as much belly aching as we do about the offensive line, there is some talent there. And I think, uh, Olu Fashano is a very talented kid. There's only one new Penn State offensive lineman on the field Saturday. I want to see what J.B. Nelson does out there coming in from Lackawanna College. Um, we've seen him at guard and tackle on the practice field, and I think because of the depth issues at offensive line, we're still not sure how the offense is going to operate on Saturday. That's a bit of a mystery at this point, but there's a chance that we see Nelson rep in both of those roles again. Um, a guy that I think, you know, you, you saw him get that late uh, rankings rise from, from our junior college evaluators at 24-7 Sports. He had to pack a lot into one year at Lackawanna but I think you like how his physical development has come along in the last year or so on the calendar. How is it going to translate? Um, and we'll get an early indication about you know, how he's handling himself against what should be a, a fairly talented defensive front for Penn State, although they are missing some ammunition in this matchup. No doubt. No doubt about it. Um, I'll move. You know what? Let's go with the quarterbacks. I'm going to go with Bo Perbula because why yeah. not? You know, I mean, yeah. you, you look and, and I'm excited to see all these guys because they all bring a little bit something different. Um, Bo is interesting to me because he's a guy that just has gone out consistently over his career and made plays and this seems like an this seems like an opportunity for him to uh you know show what he can do of course he's got the chip on his shoulder coming in with drew Aller, but i think bo can can bring something special when, when things go live I don't think it's much faster for him than it, you know, than, than a typical practice. I think the, the game, you know, he, he's able to process this game, he's able to make those throws um, and those decisions and things like that. So um, I, I keep kicking myself because I go back to February and early March. And I, I wanted to say, like, it would not shock me if Bo Perbula came out and he was a, a, the guy ahead of Drew Aller coming into practice because more physically ready. Uh, we heard the things about him in the offseason program and things like that. Um, and I didn't. And I kind of kick myself every day because I, I think that that Bo was more, I don't want to say prepared because that's not fair to, to Drew and the training that Drew has done. But he's just uh, closer to where he's going to be as a player. And I think that's going to help him, you know, in situations like the Blue White game. We can't really have this conversation, I suppose, without mentioning Drew Aller and everyone wants to go see what that ball looks like coming out of his hand down the field. I'm sure even during the the, the pre-spring game, just tune-ups, people are going to be keeping a close eye on him, taking pictures, photos, what have you. This is the kind of quarterback prospect that rarely has come to this campus here at Penn State. And when he does, there is a lot of swarming attention here. And Sean, I do wonder um, if this isn't just the perfect scenario, though, for Christian Veyu to go out and have the best day. Number two quarterback behind a starter with a, a bunch a bunch of game reps who you don't think we're going to see much of on Saturday. It feels like if there's any quarterback is going to go out there and have a chance to really rack up some of those, if anyone keeps stats in this game, but some of those pretty stat numbers, it would be Christian Veyu. We got to watch these freshman quarterback and, and we'll take a long look uh, because this is really the longest look we're going to get. It's been a lot of special teams and ball security work for us on the practice field this spring. Yeah, we're going to see some football. It's going to be great. Yeah. <laughs> um, hopefully, hopefully there's an offensive line to put together. Careful, that, that yeah. Can do that. Um, 
moving to receiver, uh, I, I'm going to let you have Malik Mega because I know you want to talk about him. But uh, Trey Wallace is a guy that you just continue to hear things like athletically. I don't know if you saw that Instagram uh, photo of him just completely hurdling a dude. He does uh, really good things when asked to jump. Uh, you, you take a look at that dunk that we posted in, in the offseason, the hurdling guys. He's a really, really super athletic kid. So I'll be interested to see how that translates to the scrimmage. Uh, you know, if he's coming out and being – a second team guy, if he's coming out and, you know, making a spectacular catch or something, it's not going to surprise me where he stands in August. I mean, that's a, probably another conversation, but I'm excited to see uh, where Trey Wallace stands because I think he's a guy that's really, really athletically, you know, kind of at the top of the charts when you talk about Penn State's receiving core. Yeah, I guess, I guess you set me up for mega, so I got to take it and run with it. And we talked about him a lot this spring, just a, a, a tantalizing talent. I mean, that's really all you can say about it with that six foot four frame and and the verified speed that's that, that going back to his camp performance here at Penn State that, that locked him in as the scholarship guy for them. Um, now here he is, uh, year three, just like Keandre Lambert Smith and Parker Washington. I know he wants to make the leap to join that group. And Mitchell Tinsley is going to try to fight him off from one side. And then you've got younger players like Harrison Wallace. But Mega, you know, all it takes, you know, what do you remember from the spring game? You remember plays. You don't really remember the collaborative thing. And he's the kind of guy that can go have that 80 yard race to the end zone that, that people, when they're driving home, they're thinking about how impressive he looked doing that. This is all about flash. There's a lot of sizzle when it comes to the spring game. It's, it's a quick peek. And because of his ability to go out and do something special on a, on a, on a very, uh, a one play to do it, I like his chances to go out and kind of, kind of wow folks a little bit. Um, I'm not sure I'll end up with seven catches, but it may just take one to have people talking about Malik Mega. I'm going to skip tight end, um, not go back to the offensive line, but I, I want to see Omari Evans. Uh, you know, mm. the, the speed, there's not too many guys, not only in this team, but probably in the conference with that type of speed. Um, whether that means he can get shifty and get upfield to do whatever, I don't know. I, I haven't, we haven't seen much of that, but as much as we've seen him repping as a kick returner, as a punt returner, um, in through with those wide receivers. Now, Obviously, he's going to have to get bigger. He's going to have to get stronger. Um, but you can't replace or you can't simulate speed like that. So I'm curious to see if Amari Evans has an impact on the game on Saturday, just to to see him break loose, to see him do something. And and you know, there, there's guys went out there when you see them take that that extra gear, you know it, and it's kind of fun to watch at times because we've seen some really really fast guys come through here. I think Evans fits up in that category as well. And also while we're doing it, Mason Stahl, uh, walk on wide receiver, formerly a quarterback. Maybe he throws a pass this weekend. Maybe he busts out his four, four speed or something like that. I'm interested to see where he lands on the final stat sheet. Yeah, there's a bunch of names I feel like you go to at wide receiver. I'm going to I'm gonna bring up a name that, that you've mentioned, maybe being position, positional, uh, versatile, or maybe not in the right spot yet, Khalil Dinkins, because uh, I'm curious to see how he looks if he gets some work at tight end. Um, I, I, he's cut my eye a little bit on the field with some of that athleticism. His size is interesting. I feel like we, 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 we've gotten a long look at Tyler Warren and, and Theo Johnson and Brenton Strange in terms of getting getting to see them involved on the practice field the last couple of years, certainly in game action. Jerry Cross, even just from physical presence, he kind of catches your eye. But I don't know really what those guys are as tight ends. And I'd imagine as we work our way through Saturday afternoon, we'll get a longer look. Maybe not at Cross quite yet, but I think Dinkins maybe accrues enough reps where we start to kind of shape in our mind what he is as a tight end prospect in his second year on campus. Because this is a guy, I I'm with you, you do wonder when you sign him, is he going to end up in that defensive front seven or is tight end the long haul decision for him? And at this stage, um, I just haven't gotten enough you know, views of reps of this young man to kind of, and this won't help. This isn't going to be a, a, a final verdict, but we should get to see him out there and we should get to see him you know, playing some tight end. And we haven't seen Theo Johnson much this spring. We haven't seen Parker Washington do all that much this thing. So reps are going to be there for the taking at certain positions, including tight end. So we'll see Tyler Warren there as well. Um, but yeah, it, it'll be exciting. I mean, you've got to uh, sort of gauge your expectations based on the offensive line and things like that. And I don't, I don't know what format they're going to put pull out there um, with nine or ten guys healthy or whatever it is. Um, but I think it's gonna, it's gonna have to be different. Uh, and we'll see what happens with those guys. But yeah, I think it's a pretty good look. Uh, just uh, I'm excited to see some of these younger guys, as we always are with the blue white game. Excited to see. You know, those those older guys get a break and, you know, kind of enjoy the festivities and, and sort of soak it in because they haven't really gotten that over the last couple of years. You think, you know, Sean Clifford's been on campus for a long, long time, but hasn't played in a ton of blue white games because yeah. they haven't really existed in the last couple of years. So excited to see the um, the the atmosphere and excited to see how those younger, player, younger players respond. 
Let's finish up here with our five-star mailbag, and it brings us to a popular topic here this spring, and it leads us to something that you just wrote on a Tuesday. How will Penn State address its obvious offensive line depth issues between now and the season? Well, that's a good question because I don't know that there's a great answer for addressing the depth issues on you know of the guys that get on the field. Obviously, Hunter Norzad's going to get here in May. He's the the key, you know, kind of uh, in in filling that out. Uh, does he you know battle Salim Wormley for that right guard spot? Uh, you know, I, I hate to say you know. I hate to say it, but but you can get by with an offensive lineman of seven guys if you stay healthy. Obviously, it never happens, but you need seven guys to be healthy uh, and seven guys that can play at this level. So you're going to fill in, and I and I keep saying it over and over again. You're going to miss guys like Caleb Conigus, Will Nutson, uh, Blake Salar, who had to medically retire, unfortunately. Walk-ons that that fill out your fill out your scout team that get different. Uh, you know, they get you different looks and things like that. Valuable, valuable guys. It's hard to find those guys because they got to pay tuition. And that's not uh, that's not an easy thing to do. You get Drew Shelton on this summer. You get Vega Ione, Malik McNeil. I don't see any of those guys being immediate contributors. Be very interested to see what Ione comes in as. And if he's a guy that can potentially maybe be a redshirt, uh, contribute to redshirt freshman, something like that remains to be seen. But we did write up our uh, seven commits uh, on the uh, on the offensive line for the walk-ons. Check that out. A uh, couple of tackles in there. Matthew Dedish from Western Pennsylvania. Jim Fitzgerald, 6'7", 325. You don't get too many of those guys. Uh, you know, it's going to take some work uh, for those guys to get on the field, but you don't get too many of those guys that are legitimately sized offensive linemen. He's from Archbishop Spalding, which, of course, Zaki Wheatley came out of. Um, uh, Shelton's teammate Samuel Siafa is going to come in and play Dominic Rooley. And then they got three guys this week in Jack Conry, an, an interior guy from the Bronx, uh, Fordham Prep, Ian Harvey from Springford High School in Royersford, Pennsylvania, and then Ben Hartman, um, the uh, uh, was a former Oregon walk-on commit from uh, Alpharetta, Georgia, uh, Milton High School, and he flipped to Penn State this week. So they're doing what they can to supplement the numbers. I mean, that's adding what 11, 11 bodies uh, from May to seemingly August. We'll see if all these guys make it to campus with walk-ons. You never know because that tuition is an issue. You know, there's a lot of things that can pop up. Guys can get offers at any time or whatnot, but adding 11 guys to the mix makes you feel a lot better when you're trying to fill out, uh, you know, essentially a three deep, whether you know, the last rung of that is all scholarship or excuse me, is all walk-on guys or whatever just helps to have numbers. I mean, you, you like I said, you cannot imagine how valuable these guys that are out of the program, like Conagus and Nutson are getting scholarship offers in the transfer pool. They've got two years left to play and that's great for them. Um, but uh, having those guys around and being consistent for the last couple of years really goes a long way and you can't tip your hat enough to those guys. Yeah. When you have guys on your scout team, even that you that know the drill and, and just they don't slow up practice because you don't have to repeat yourself. You don't have to get them. That's that's valuable information because wasted time on the practice field is wasted opportunity. And seven walk ons that is equal to the number of offensive line we saw participating in practice last week. So from a health standpoint and, and preventing just a damaging load uh, on all these guys, that's going to be important stuff. And, and as you said, maybe there's some impact players eventually from the walk on group. But the scholarship bundle that you're bringing in the transfer, of course, you hope that there's some some game day impact from the rest of that uh the reinforcements coming in this it's, summer sean so, i'm not sure it, what it, is going to happen yeah i don't i don't know it's so tough to make it as an offensive lineman as a walk-on so oh to get gosh. seven of these guys that are willing you know pay their own way do all that kind of stuff go through that i mean we we saw last year you know guys that uh you know were, were set to walk on at penn state that were out the door before the first practice i mean this is kind of how walk-ons work it's it's not a it, you know, Rudy is great, but it's not an envious <laughs> lifestyle for anybody. I mean, it's no. it, it's really, really tough for these guys to come in and and make that, uh, you know, have that kind of dedication and do all that kind of stuff. It's really, really a special thing that you have to go through. And it's a really hard thing that you have to go through. Playing college football is very hard. And that's something that we lose sight of because of all the glory and all that kind of stuff. But doing this is very hard. Doing it, paying paying for it is even harder. So Hat tip to these guys because that that takes a special situation for those guys to to, to make this happen, for you know, the the, the limited chance uh, of glory. And I hate saying it like that because um, it's it's more of a numbers thing. But uh, yeah, it's a it's, it's a special special undertaking for these guys, and certainly certainly wish these guys the best. 
Uh, full review of that group up on lines247.com. Uh, we are going to step away for now. When we come back later in the week, perhaps we'll have more clarity on what the offensive line situation might mean for that spring game setup. We're going to be on the field again Wednesday. James Franklin do up again some various players. Follow along with us at lines247.com. We'll review the latest and we'll give our final thoughts on the defense ahead of the blue-white matchup uh, later on this week. For Sean Fitz, for producer Lance Glenn, I'm Tyler Donahue. Thanks for listening to the Lions 24-7 podcast.